Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour here on YouTube, brought to you by the Lodge people at Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island. My name is Jim Gallagher, and I am the pastor, the teaching elder at Clavel Assembly, and welcome to our YouTube channel. I've been given my uh, testimony of how I uh, was called into the ministry. I did part one last time, and I'll finish my story off uh, today, part two. And I want to start off by reading from Jeremiah, where in chapter 1, <clears throat> uh, the Lord says to Jeremiah, Bef Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Well, let's get this squared away right up front. I'm no Jeremiah, and I'm not saying that I am, okay? But there's a principle here. I think God, God has a plan, I don't think, God has a plan for each and every one of us as his people. And if men are to teach and instruct in the body of Christ, they, they should be called. And we're not necessarily called the same way they did before the coming of Christ in 70 AD. I think it's a little bit different because the circumstances are different. I don't want to go into that because I don't have the time. But I do think we're all called to whatever it is God would have us do. We're called to marry a certain person or to not be married. We're called into a certain profession. Uh, but th does that mean we always enter into it? No, we can rebel against God and do something that wouldn't be wise. Uh, but I don't think we can disobey the, the Lord. There's no genuine disobedience of the Lord if there's ignorance of what he wants. You say, well, how do I know what field the Lord wants me to go in? I just kind of picked it. Well, I mean, I think your conscience will come into play. I think the direction of the Lord is able to open doors and close doors. I, I think it all works out in the end. You know, you have to use your ability to choose wisely, but you use the to the best of your ability and make those cho choices. And if you're one of God's people, he'll guide you in that. But you can still rebel and choose the wrong thing and even convince yourself at the time that you're doing the right thing. I got to clean my glasses. They're a little dirty. <laughs> I can see... But I need these for reading, you know? Well, anyway, okay, so uh, I'm no Jeremiah. I'm not saying I am, but there's a principle. I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And I almost didn't go to business school because I'd have to take a pub public speaking course. But yeah, I'm thinking, well, the Lord might be calling me in the ministry. I was scared to death to take a speaking course and have to stand up and give a five-minute speech in front of a class of my peers. I ended up getting an A in the class. I don't know how, because I never raised my hand in class to answer a question. I did not want to speak publicly. I almost didn't go to college because of that. But preaching is different. I preached my first sermon and spoke publicly in a real way when I preached my first sermon at Clayville. I did teach a Sunday school class in the evangelical church I went to. So I did do that, but that's quite a bit different from preaching from the pulpit at Clavel with the old war horse, Pastor Cugini, standing there watching and listening to my every move. But uh, I'll tell you, I enjoyed it. And the... So I didn't want to go into a field I had to publicly speak, but I felt like the Lord was calling me to speak. So to go to business school and publicly speak scared the daylights out of me. To go in the ministry to do it, not so much. I felt the Lord was calling. So, but I was kind of like, you know, the prophet here, right? Just like Moses, law, I can't do this. I needed someone to speak for me. No, oh, how about Aaron, you know? <laughs> hey, come on, Moses. Make excuses. The Lord condescended to Moses. Well, you know, the prophet Jeremiah, I guess we're, we're all the same. We kind of come out of the same cloth. Oh, I'm not, I can't, I, I can't do this. Behold, I cannot speak, he says, for I'm a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. But thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. 
It requires all of that. So, uh, you know, my call to the ministry, how, do, how is the Lord calling me? Well, it's a, a kind of a long, circuitous story. You know, I noticed, I, I don't hardly read my comments usually, but I saw in the last one I made, I wanted to make sure it was up. And at the time, there was only like one comment, and the fella said, uh, um, I don't know, it was something dumb. Like, who, uh, who called you, God? No, uh, no, I don't think so. Like, who called you, God? Like, no, that can't be. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, a, 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 a valid point, I suppose. <laughs> what? <laughs> and it doesn't matter what people like that say. See, they're, they're offended because they don't know how to respond. Well, for instance, let someone like that respond to Revelation 1.1. Simple. It's the first, first sentence in the book of Revelation. John is writing about things to shortly come to pass. Don't tell me how it can't be true. Tell me how it can be true, because that's what John says. Tell me what John means. Tell me what that verse means. Tell me what it means in its context. I'm not talking about taking some obscure portion from, say, Ezekiel or Isaiah that is more complicated and have to tie it in with a bunch of... I'm talking about something simple right from the New Testament, the book of Revelation. One, one. John was writing about things to shortly come to pass. I'm saying he did that. He did what he said. I'm a Bible believer. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe in John the Apostle in his authoritative writings, and in Paul and Peter and the rest. <laughs> my call to the ministry is not based on people's opinions of what they think about my call to the ministry, but I'm telling you my call to the ministry. Maybe it can be a help of someone that the Lord is actually dealing with, and it's really kind of meant for them. But it can also be useful for the instruction of all God's people because the Lord will call you to certain things. So anyway, I'll tell my story, and uh, <clears throat> it's amazing. You know, I don't want to repeat because I don't have the time to. But I said before I got married, I told my my, I told Paula, my soon-to-be new wife, I believe at the time, uh, said, you know, I think the Lord is going to call me into the ministry in the middle of my life, like when I'm 40. At the time, I was most scared for that to happen. I was a very security-minded young man. Um, that, 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 you know, just, just blindly trust the Lord to take everything you have. You've been building half your life and sell your home and all the equity and the job security you had, building a career, and then just take it all to spend on seminary and then uh, you know, and, and I knew that the, the ministry is a tough business. It's a high burnout turnover rate. It, there's a lot of stress in the ministry because congregations like to boot their preachers out and pretend they're filled with the Holy Spirit when they do it. Some preachers need to be booted out. But a lot of that just takes place on a very shady basis and they can destroy ministers and their families for no good reason. I mean, I think most I honestly, I, I do think most churches should be out of business in the order, as I say, three quarter inch screwed uh, CDX and take some nice long, you know, uh, six inch wood screws and <laughs> just screw those plywood right over the windows and doors. That would be the sign of revival. But there's a remnant out there, and I know there are, and there are many of you that are listening here, and uh, the Lord has called you, and He's working in your life. I know that. But for those whose lives God is actually working in, you're also going to find the touch of grace in Christian compassion and understanding for those who understand less. You have to have that patience with those who understand less. We all do. I mean, we've all been there. I still require patience of people. How should I not show patience to others? Right? So I told her, you know, the, the scariest thing, well, if the Lord calls me, I think that's what's going to happen. My, and Paul says, yeah, I know. I married the right woman. I did. What has it been? It's been 42 years? 41, 42 years? Hope, Paul, you're not listening on the exact number, right? Well, I guess maybe in October. Let's see. Uh, it'd be 42, 3, 3, 4. Well, I guess it'd be in October. 41 years going on 42. I think I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. 
She's very patient with me, so I can take these risks. <laughs> so I went and took, you know, I uh, we got married. I told you about how I got, I, 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 I got, we got married, and we found an apartment. We found a church. I found a car, and I got a job all within like a few days just before we're getting married. And I was on the verge of saying, Paula, we got to send out the invitation list to our marriage because I, you know, I mar- we got I graduated from college in May, and here it is in August, and I don't have a job yet. It was the tail end of Jimmy Carter. And the Lord gave me just like about three weeks before we had to get married, about four weeks, three to four weeks, I got the job and then I found an apartment. I got And I got the apartment, the car, and a church all on the same day or the same, the day and the day after. Everything, all the pieces came together. Then I went to work and said, look, I'm getting married next week. I worked the new job one week as a manager trainee. I said, uh, I don't know if I can get an extra day for something, you know, go away to New Hampshire or something. They said, yo, you're getting married? Take a week. The Lord provided. They said, is this part of your call to ministry? It is, because I told her, the Lord's going to call me to ministry. And she said, and it's going to be when it's the most scary, in the middle of my life. She says, yeah, I know. <laughs> Paul's a good woman. So um, we, I, I, took, I took the job, and then I took a job at Etna Casualty and Surety and was working there. And we had to move to the Hartford area. We went to stores, and then we went to Bloomfield, which read us out of Hartford. And I was doing the job. Uh, But to make a long story short, I couldn't stay in that job. (laughs) I couldn't stay. I looked at my clock, trying to find my clock. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you that whole story. It's a good story to tell. But the Lord says, no, you can't work here. They wanted me to give the United Way. I wasn't going to give the United Way. They support abortion. And they're leaning heavy like, you really have to. They wanted me to think creatively on my expense report so I could justify my company car. The the, the rule of the company was, you got to put 1,000 miles a month in order to have a company car. Well, I was averaging like 900. I was always below 1,000. They said, look, we're going to take away your company car. And they said, you know, just be creative with your report. I'm not going to cheat in my report. They go, well, we don't want to see you lose your car. Look, you know, I'm not telling you this, you know, but that's what you got to do. And I'm like, no. And it was one thing after another. And I was doing my job. I was doing it well. They loved me and they gave me the highest raise I could get. But I could tell the corporate world was not going to be for this guy. And I enjoyed the job. And the whole time we're there, we could never find a church to make a home. We're there for almost a year and a half, and we kept going to church to church. And the places that were nice, they were fine. They had a lot that was right, and we could go and visit. But to say, this is how I'm going to raise my family when I have a family? No, no. So push came to shove. We moved. I I moved back to Rhode Island and left the insurance field started my own company doing stuff. And the minister that was at the the church I grew up in, I went back to after we moved, I left that career, we moved back to Rhode Island. That pastor told me, he sat me down, he says, I think the Lord is calling you to the ministry. I told him, well, I already knew that. His name was Ed Whitford. I said, "I, I, I know that. He says, then why don't you go to Gordon Conwell Seminary? And when you come back, I'm going to set the situation up and say, you need to make Jim, the next pastor here, and I'll leave. I had a lot of respect for Ed Whitford. He was an Arminian. He wasn't a Calvinist. But I had respect for them. Some of you people out there, you're, you're, you're Arminians, and you say, all oh, these Calvinists are unconverted. You know, that uncharitable nature is almost proof to me you're unconverted. There's no grace. You're willing to cut everybody off. I think there's a lot of Arminians that aren't saved, yeah. I think there can be some people that are Arminians that are genuinely confused because of bad teaching. I think that happens. But people want to blackwash all their opposition. And that is just not the Christian way. It really isn't. Like, I got strong opinions, but they, got, they have to be held within a context of a grace that understands the, inconsist- the inconsistencies of man. And that's true for all of us. 
That doesn't mean we make peace with our inconsistencies, but we recognize it's part of the human condition. So at any rate, uh, I, Pastor uh, Whitford was saying, I believe the Lord's calling the ministry. I said, well, I already knew that. He says, go to Gordon Conwell Seminary, and then you come back here, and you'll be the pastor. That was the church I grew up in. But I knew full well, when he left the assembly, he kind of kept it. We were, they were, it was like the liberals versus the conservatives. And of course, I would be on the conservative side, and so was the pastor. But he was a strong force. And he was kind of keeping the war at bay. And when he left for me to come into that situation as a young man, as a first pastor, no, 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 no. I, I did not for a second think that was God's will and God's providence in my life. That was more of the Lord testing me. See? And I didn't have any doubt about that. Well, in the end, I had to leave and we went uh, to that, from, leave from that church, and we went to a fundamentalist Baptist church. They were dispensational. I was not dispensational, but I didn't really understand too much what dispensationalism was. I just didn't believe in the secret rapture, that kind of thing. And um, but they were conservative. They were fundamentalists and and you know fire breathing, uh, you know stalwarts. And there were some arguments that they weren't going to have that I appreciated. They didn't have to have those arguments in that church. So. I was enjoying myself at first. You know, there's some things I disagreed with, but, you know, I let that bygones be bygones. Everybody's got their, their blind spots, right? But over the course of time, <clears throat> that pastor of that church, dispensational, he set me aside and he told me, I think the Lord's calling you to the ministry. I said, well, I do too. And he's like, well, you need to, you know, suggested some uh, fundamentalist Baptist seminary, and I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. I didn't say that to him. But then I knew I had some differences. I got to find out, if I'm going to get some advice from him, I got to find out, so what's this deal with dispensationalism? And I, I also knew by listening to Pastor Cugini, who was my predecessor at Clavel on the radio, I heard him on the radio, and he was talking about the Israel of God, election and predestination. I said, are these things true? So I had him tugging at me from the radio, and then I had the fundamentalist I was with. But I came to realize that the fundamentalism, not fundamentalism, but dispensationalism has a lot of problems in it that create not just eschatological differences, but can, aff can affect. It doesn't always with people because we have contradictions, but it can oftentimes affect their understanding of soteriology and salvation, and that many of them go into the easy believism camp. Understand, I know that all of them don't, but many of them do, and I was not going to go for that. So I come to find out dispensationalism has, dispensationalism has deep roots in era that can be very, very dangerous. I couldn't train in one of those schools. I would never end up graduating. I knew that. But yet that minister was telling me, just like the other minister, I think the Lord's calling you ministry. And before any of them said it, I said, well, I, I already know that. But, you know, I've been, the Lord has kept saying not yet, you know. And as I was studying, and I'm still at the Dispensational Fundamentalist Church, I came to realize how bad dispensationalism was, the easy believism, easy believism of that wing of fundamentalism that I was connected to. And I realized I did believe in election and predestination. So I typed out a letter about the Israel of God. I haven't talked about that specifically on this channel, and I will do that at some point. And I presented the letter to the pastor at the Fundamentalist Church and said, look, I, well, I've got some doctrinal differences. I'm not trying to, I'm not looking for you to respond to these points I made. It was like a, I don't remember. It was maybe like five pages. I, don't, I can't remember now. But it was maybe like five pages typed out, I put it in a binder, and I said, here's some of the issues that I'm having, and I give it to you, not for you to answer me, I'm not a gotcha moment. Um, look it over, and it may be I have some blind spots. Maybe there's some things you can bring to the fore to show me where I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm willing to entertain that. But take your time, and, and, and you get back to me, because I need to know where I stand so I know what kind of seminary to go to. So... You know, a week went by, two weeks went by, four weeks went by, two months went by, four months went by. He's not going to answer me. And so he finally sent the assistant pastor to deal with me. Well, he was like fresh out of college, a little wet behind the ears, and he came and he had 
he came, I had my questions, and so he had all his old, all his old school notebooks and textbooks and looking for answers to things. Okay, okay, this is, he doesn't know either. And that went nowhere. Until finally they were kind of giving me the, the plain hint. It's time for you to go away because you believe things too different from us and you're too strong in your beliefs. Go away. They didn't have the nerve to say it, but they I kind of got the shunning, the shunning treatment. I think, well, that's not a really proper way to deal with another Christian, even though you might disagree with them. But they didn't have the wisdom to do otherwise. And so I knew my time to go was now. Uh, I had been listening to Pastor Kuji in the radio talk about the Israel of God. Now I came to the realization, we are the Israel of God. I heard him talking about election and predestination, so I studied that. Yes, and you know how that happened? I got to tell you, we were playing volleyball on my front lawn on the 4th of July, and a young man that went to my the church I grew up in, the evangelical church, who still was there, was at my house. We are playing volleyball, and he spiked the, the volleyball, uh, you know, right down in, into me and got a point like, oh, okay, I got to pay him back. I'm going to spike one down right on top of his head, you know? But then we rotated. So now we're not lined up. Oh. And so a ball came over and it was not really for me to get. The guy behind me should have got it. So I jumped up and I tried, it was just so high. I had to reach so high and jump so high. I, could, I had to I twist myself and tried to spike it and I couldn't spike it where I wanted to, but I did spike it, I guess. I don't but I came down off balance because I was trying too hard. I just wanted it because we we're going to rotate again. And my it was dusk and my foot slid on the wet grass and I broke my ankle. And here's the thing. I was looking for a Bible school to train in. I'm li- I've left the dispensational church. I just started going to Clayville just as a, a holding point to find a school. And I said, Lord, I got to know what I believe about election and predestination and this Israel of God thing. Because I thought the Jews are God's chosen people. We restored them in 1948, fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Is Pastor Grugini right? He was saying some things that really seemed like he was right, which would mean I'm wrong. But I didn't know. So I prayed to the Lord, I need to know where I stand in these doctrines. So Lord, here's what I got to do. I own my own company with my brother. And uh, I needed, we did roofing. And I said, uh, I need, to, Lord, I need time off to study this. My brother, I can't say to my brother, look, I need a month off so I can study the Bible so I know where to go to Bible school so I can leave the business. <laughs> so, Lord, I don't know what to do. I, and I don't have the time owning my own business and all the stuff you got to do to like study this all out. I need to know now it's the most important thing. And you're going to think I'm crazy. But I said, Lord, maybe if I got injured and I got laid up, I got an excuse not to work, and I could use that recuperation time to study the Bible about election and about the Israel of God. And but Lord, I don't want anything too debilitating, you know, you know, break a bone or something like that, that the most. Uh, something that'll be, oh Lord, I, I don't know. It's just a dumb example. But I actually prayed that. And it was two weeks later, we were playing volleyball, bo- bo- about two weeks, I'm guessing. Uh, we were playing volleyball, and I broke my ankle. Paul is driving me to the emergency room, and I'm saying, oh, no, this is terrible. We're in the middle of summer. We're in our busy season. Got all these roofs to do. We're booked for several months, and now I'm not going to be able to work. I'm complaining, and she's driving me. And I'm like, ah, oh, my ankle hurts. And I go, wait a minute. What a minute. Oh, you dummy. I remembered. I prayed just like a couple weeks ago. Hurt me. You say, you really didn't do that. Yes, I did. I can't overemphasize. I can't overstate how important it was for me to get the answers I need so I had a direction. I had a family. I had a a wife, child. And I said, this is the Lord's answer my prayer. And so I stayed off the roof for about three weeks. And those three weeks, I studied. I got up in the morning at 6 o'clock. And at 11 o'clock at night, I was still studying the Bible. I stopped to eat, to go to the bathroom, to take a shower. And then three times a week, I'd go and and work out. But during the workouts, I was talking doctrine to the guy I was working out with, the the future elder at Clayville, the man who spiked the volleyball in my face. 
<laughs> and and uh, we, we just started talking doctrine. He's hearing these doctrinal changes I've having, and it began to rub off on him. Then he went and started to study at home, and come to find out, oh, what, what Jim is saying about election and predestination is true. And he started to see the things I was seeing, and I was sharing them with him. Then he went and studied on his own, like he had to be a Berean. He wasn't taking my word for it. He's coming to the same conclusions. And the workouts just became theological discussions. <laughs> I wasn't getting much done. Anyway, after three weeks, I had my answer. So I had a cast on my leg. I had to get, get back to work. I still got this cast. So I, I said, I'm going to go work anyway. I went up on the roof, 90, 90 degrees out, up on a hot, humid roof. It's 20 degrees hotter on the, on the asphalt shingles. And I, of course, I couldn't carry 80-pound bundles, so I had the crew just drop bundles right by my side. I just keep shingling, and I'd go up the roof on my elbow and my knee, and I'd just drag my cast. After about a week, my leg stunk so much, I couldn't stand myself. You can't take a shower, it was a hard cast. So I went downstairs, and I was going to schedule to have it off, cut off in another four or five days. I couldn't wait four or five more days. It stunk too much, and I had to work. So <laughs> I went in the basement and got myself a hacksaw, I cut my own cast off my leg. <laughs> then I went to the doctor, the doctor to have it removed and have him check it. Yeah, okay, he has it. Put your leg up. And he goes, okay. And he has a, a saw. He turns around. Where's your cast? I said, I cut it off. He said, you did what? He goes, what'd you cut it off with? I said, a hacksaw. He goes, what? <laughs> it all worked out. God answered my prayer. So I was asked Pastor Gugini, and now I'm Pastor, the holding church till I find seminary. When I got there, I said, Pastor, can you recommend a good Bible school, a seminary that will teach this, 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 and this? And these are things that are not very common, like election, predestination, Israel of God. Uh, we didn't believe in using modern Bibles, doctrine of separation. I, I was finding a hard time, and I was sending out materials to colleges like Reformed colleges, Calvinist colleges that might believe a lot of these things for training the ministry. And I get back brochures from these places, Calvin's College and all these different places, Reformed Seminary. And I, when I get the brochures back that, that are meant to lure me in, I'd look at them, and just by looking at the brochure for like less than three minutes, I don't want to train for the ministry there. They were evangelicals who were calling themselves Reformed, as one man put it. I said, no, I did not feel at all. I didn't have any question. The Lord is not calling me to that. I thought those were going to be, and after I exhausted those from what I knew, I didn't know what to do. So I'm stuck at Clayville. And when I asked Pastor Gugini, can you recommend a good school when I first got there? He says, no, I'm not in the business of recommending any schools. I go, what do you mean? I, I, this is the, these are your doctrines? You must have someone, some seminary you graduated from. Tell me the school. He goes, I can't recommend any schools. My, I tell you, you just come here. So can, he's saying give up pursuing the ministry. I'm not going to do that. But I had to stay somewhere. I actually went back to the fundamentalist church for a couple months and said, what am I doing? I'll stay at Clayville till I find the seminary. So I'm at Clayville, and I was enjoying what I was hearing. I was just thinking, I can't, I got to go to a seminary. It's not going to be doing me any good forwarding myself in the ministry sitting here. But I'm, I'm, I got to go someplace. I'm, I'm there and I was happy I was there hearing some amazing things and some scary things. Well, I was at Clayville and I'm going to say, it's hard to tell exactly to remember. Oh, I also wrote to John Bray who used to be a, he was a Southern Baptist and then he became an evangelist and he came to the truth in his retirement of the Israel of God and wrote some nice papers on it and actually became a preterist. I didn't know he was a preterist and he maybe he wasn't at the time, but he was teaching the Israel of God and I read his book. I said, that's really good. So I wrote to John Bray, who was in Florida, said, can you recommend a Bible school, a seminary that will teach this, 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 this? And he wrote back and said, you're in a church that teaches all that? And I said, yes. And he said, my suggest I can't recommend a school. Now, he's just like Pastor Cogini, and they didn't even know each other. He says, I would suggest you just stay in the church you're in and let the Lord open the right doors. Which is what pretty much what Pastor Cogini was saying to me. I thought, what's that mean? This isn't a seminary. How how's that going to help? But I didn't have any other option, so I was there. And I don't know how long it was, but um, 
maybe it was two years later. We're driving, and I'm in Pastor Gugini's car. We're on the way to go protest Jesus Christ Superstar. And I'm riding with Pastor Gugini. And he said, Brother Jim, we got in the parking garage in Providence. Before we get out, no, no, before we leave, he goes, I got to ask you something. I say, what's that? And he turns to me. He's sitting behind the steering wheel. He turns to me. I'm in the front seat. He says, Brother Jim, we're the only ones in the car. And he just looks at me and says, would you be willing, and this is how he said it, he pointed his finger at me and he spoke it this way, would you be willing for me to train you for the ministry at Clayville the way Paul trained Timothy? I'd never heard anything like that before. What? You mean, you train me and I'd become the pastor at Clayville by your tutoring? I didn't ask that question, but I knew what he was saying. Would, and I never heard of that. I never for a second thought I'll stay at Clayville because one day he'll ask me that. I only knew of people going to Bible schools and seminaries, getting the stamp of approval, and then going to a church as a pastor. When he said that, I instantly knew this is what the Lord was planning all along. There's no guy that can come in the comment section that has anything he can say. There's nothing that can dislodge me. I know God's providence in my life. This was something I'd been living with for 20 years, more than 20 years. He's calling me, but not now. Call me, but not now. And the truth is, as I sold my house, at the time I had maybe $10,000 of equity in the house. So I go to seminary, I'm going to go in debt with a wife who wasn't working and a, a little child. And to go to what church? Well, now at least I knew the doctrine, but the doctrines are making us kind of putting us in a small group. Pastor Gugini, and in those two years, Pastor Gugini never gave me a hint. You stay here. You might find you'll be in the ministry. Anyway. Never, never gave me a hint that there was anything waiting for me at Clayville. And when he said that, I responded within a second and I just said, and we were small. We were like, you know, I don't know what we were, 25 people, no young people, all older. But Pastor Kojini was a firebomb. And he asked me that question and it took me one second to say, yes, I will do that. And I knew it was God's will. There was, wow. All those years of worry and concern and back and forth, what do I do? What I should have done is just trust the Lord. I mean, I was trusting him, but I was fretting, fretting as I was going. All the stars lined up, you see. <laughs> it was God's grace. So, I, you know, I became an elder, and he trained me for 10 years. And when he left, I'd become the pastor. And he made that announcement. I was an elder, and he appointed me as assistant to the elder, not assistant pastor. There's no such position. But assistant to the elder, which means I'm training him, and when I leave, he takes my place. Well, 10 years later, Pastor Cugini died. He died. I became the pastor at Clayville Assembly when, guess what? I was 40 years old. When Pastor Cugini entered the ministry, he came to Clavo for the first time. You know how old he was? 40 years old. He died when he was 80 years old. And I was 40 years old. He started at 40 and lived to 80. I became the pastor at 40. Wow. But after he said, Brother Jim... Would you be willing for me to train you for the ministry the way Paul did Timothy? I said, yes. So, okay. And we just started our process. And I would teach Sunday school class. He'd have me preach sermons once in a while. He'd give me little tests and do things and meet with me and give counsel. And we'd, you know, we'd cover to like some basic Greek stuff and uh, that kind of thing. And then it was like two or three years later, maybe even more, it could have been like, I think it, honestly, I think it was more like six years later, seven years later. But I don't want to overstate it, but I, I honestly think it was six or seven years later, before he died. But he said something. I said, no, wait a minute. Explain that again. 
He goes, didn't I ever tell you? I don't know. And he said, well, remember that first time you showed up at Clayville and you said to me, can you recommend a school? And I said, no, I won't. You just come here. And he just turned around and walked away like gruff like. I'm thinking, oh, this guy. First time I was there. What's the matter with him? And so that's why I, I, I left. I didn't stay. I, I went back to the church for two months, the fundamentalist church. And I said, you know what? Gruff though he might be, he's doctrinally correct. I'm going back there until I find that seminary. So I'm there, and he, and he, he asked me to be the trainee to be, take over. And then after I've been training under him for years, he said something. And I said, whoa, 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 say that again. He goes, didn't I tell you that? I said, no. He said, remember that first time you came and you asked me for a school and I said no, and then you disappeared for two months. He goes, what you didn't know, now listen to this carefully. He said, what you didn't know is the elders at Clavel had been praying for the Lord to send someone that I could train to take my place. He says, I had two heart attacks within six months, just before you came. And the Lord was telling me, you need to slow down and prepare yourself to train the next man. He said, but there was no one in our assembly that was being called into the ministry. So we just asked, prayed, Lord, and they weren't connected with any group. Lord, you're going to have to send someone out of the blue. And then I come knocking on the door and saying, hey, I believe everything you believe. Give me a seminary. Rather than saying, hey, we've been praying and give me a heads up. This is what Pastor Cugini thought, and this shows you his great faith. He says, if this is the man that's sent by God, then the Lord will screw him to his seat, and he'll stay here. So Pastor Cugini was gruff with me, intentionally, short, gave me no hint of any chance of me entering the ministry through Clayville Assembly. And for years, uh, even before he ever said, would you be willing for me, and then he finally did that, um, he never told me, I never thought that was possible. I said, why did you sit in, the, sit in that? He goes, because I thought, if this is really of the Lord, then you'll be here when I feel it's ready for me to say to you, I'm willing to train you. And he let me go for a couple of years until he asked me that question. And I said, yes, it was the sovereign providence of God. I will never forget it. And I am humbled by it. People can say what they want in the comment section. It really doesn't matter. Do I have everything right in my mind? No, no man does. But I know how the Lord has graciously dealt with me. And the Lord has been gracious ever since. I'd love to continue that story, but that's not what I'm doing. That's my call to the ministry. I've left some things out for time's sake, and I'm overdue. But uh, let's see, uh, this coming Thursday, the next time I'll talk about something else, and then I think right after that we'll go back into, we'll enter into for the first time, how can we say that Christ returned 2,000 years ago? You've shown where they said it'll be soon at hand and near. Okay, like that's all over the place, but how could that be? We're going to start that process. Not next time, but probably the week after. So stay tuned and invite your friends. I got to go. Jim Gallagher, reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, and the truth, if you believe it, and you trust in him. I had to learn that. Shall make you free.